Good morning and welcome to the CNX Resources fourth quarter 2023 Q&A conference call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing star then zero on your telephone keypad. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Tyler Lewis, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you and good morning everybody. Welcome to CNX's fourth quarter Q&A conference call. Today, we will be answering questions related to our fourth quarter and full year results. This morning, we posted to our investor relations website an updated slide presentation and detailed fourth quarter earnings release data, such as quarterly E&P data, financial statements, and non-GAAP reconciliations, which can be found in a document titled 4Q 2023 Earnings Results and Supplemental Information of CNX Resources. Also, and as previously announced, we posted to our investor relations website our prepared remarks for the quarter. This is a new format to better streamline the earnings process and dissemination of information. So we hope that everyone had a chance to read the prepared remarks before the call, as the call today will be used exclusively for Q&A. With me today for Q&A are Nick Deolius, our President and CEO, Alan Shepard, our Chief Financial Officer, Namit Beal, our Chief Operating Officer, and Ravi Srivastava, President of our New Technologies Group. Please note that the company's remarks made during this call, including answers to questions, include forward-looking statements, which are subject to various risks and uncertainties. Statements are not guarantees of future performance, and our actual results may differ materially as a result of many factors. A discussion of risks and uncertainties related to those factors and CNX's business is contained in its filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission and in the release issued today. With that, thank you for joining us this morning. And operator, can you please open the call up for Q&A at this time? Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. If at any time your question has been addressed and you would like to withdraw your question, please press star then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. The first question comes from Bertrand Donas with Truist. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, just wanted to start off on the, the new tech uh, free cash flow guidance. Um, maybe could you talk about specifically what's changed over the past three months to kind of impact your outlook? And then, I, you know, I suspect it's probably pricing. But um, secondly, is it a matter of IRRs when you when you discussed in your prepared remarks about the incentive for new expansion? Is it is it IRRs not meeting some sort of internal threshold, or is it maybe that the, the projects have actually flipped to a negative free cash flow territory? Thanks. Hey, Bertrand, this is Ravi. Uh, and uh, uh, on the on the, uh, the new tech uh, cash flow side of things, you're right. Uh, the way, what, what's going to impact the cash flows for new tech is two things. The volume that qualifies for different programs, and I think uh, the team's done a great job of maximizing what those volumes can be. Uh, we've provided a guidance of about 15 to 18 BCF that qualifies for these various programs. And uh, we were focused on getting all that volume uh, uh, kind of turned in line. So that's that's happened. We were pretty excited about that uh, that, that part of it. And the second thing that ex that impacts what the free cash flow is going to be is what the pricing is. And uh, we've, we have seen some softening of, uh, of pricing, uh, specifically in the APS market for the Tier 1 RECs and uh, and and that and that's driven the cash flows down. But uh, 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 but there's some seasonality, there's some volatility that kind of comes in into that. What the pricing that we were seeing in Q3, Q4 of last year, there's no reason why we could not go back to those types of pricing later in the year. But what we're trying to do is providing uh, guidance based on the information that we have available at this point in time, and that's that's where that market stands at this point in time. And uh, 
on the on the future investment standpoint, that's correct. I think we have a portfolio of opportunities that we can invest our capital into, and uh, uh, we do have opportunity to go and capture more gas. But uh, at this point in time, with the incentive structure that's available through the programs that we have access to at this point in time, uh, we're limited in terms of how much more capital we can invest uh, to capture this uh, uh, more uh, waste methane. That, that makes sense. And then um, just shifting gears a little bit, the, it looks like the, the, the footnote on full year 24 um, cash unit cost just ticks up a little bit versus the, the 4Q23 disclosure. I, is there any color on which bucket is maybe going up and, and does that reverse if, you know, you ramp up your production? Thanks. No, so the way to think about those quarterly, quarterly, um, quarter to quarter kind of unit cost numbers, they fluctuate based on kind of the production volumes for the quarter and potential maintenance projects that slide around between quarters. The way to think about it is always to look to the sort of annual guidance that we provide. Um, and then you'll see the, that's kind of the way you should think about modeling that so on an annual basis because there's noise in quarter to quarter. Okay. So there's nothing specifically going up, you know, that we should no. like not GA or LOE. Okay. Got it. No. Thanks, guys. The next question comes from Zach Parham with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I guess first, another one on new tech. Uh, in December, you announced you were no longer partnering with the Adams Fork project, which was one of the potential driver, drivers of uh, future new tech free cash flow growth. Can you talk a little bit about the drivers uh, that you expect to, you know, you've talked about growing new tech from here. Maybe what what drives that higher than the 75 million in 2024 as we go out into 2025 and future years? Exactly. That's a great question. Uh, so uh, the way I would look at new tech free cash flow growth, uh, you could uh, you could put them into, uh, uh, I would say, three different buckets. Uh, one is uh, the environmental attribute opportunities, uh, we talked about the volume that qualifies for some of these opportunities being 15 to 18 BCF. Uh, so we can we can grow that volume. For that volume to grow, there's better incentive that's, that needs to be available for it. Uh, so we're we're looking for other opportunities, other incentive uh, uh, programs where or other pathways that can be created where uh, uh, the, the realization for these uh, environmental attributes can be uh, you know uh, we can realize more value for these. So. Uh, so we're looking at a, 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 a portfolio of opportunities on that front. So if that happens, not only the realizations go up, there's opportunity to add more volume to it. So that's that's one uh, pathway to grow new tech free cash flows. The second part of it that we have uh, that we have talked about in the past is we 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 have a technology portfolio that we're trying to uh, to, to to create value out of. And I think uh, 24 is going to be the year where uh, uh, we've been in the, the prototype and testing phase for a lot of that stuff. But I think this year we start to see uh, that uh, those opportunities start to take uh, commercial scale. So we're excited about those. I think uh, more to come on that front in the coming quarters. But we're very excited with the with the with the with the progress that we have seen on that front. And then the third part is this alternate fuel uh, opportunity where. Uh, Hydrogen projects or uh, getting into CNG, LNG market uh, 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 opportunities creates opportunity for new tech to to grow its uh, its cash flows. And and again, I think it it it, it dovetails with the technology of uh, uh, and IP opportunities that we have that creates uh, CNG and LNG opportunities for us. So so more to come on that front. But uh, uh, we're pretty excited about what we have in our portfolio and uh, uh, and uh, those uh, those three. Uh, different buckets combined is what's going to drive new tech cash flows uh, in the in the coming years. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, maybe my follow up on the E and P business. Um, Eleven of your thirty five planned turning lines in twenty twenty four will be in the central PA area versus the southwest PA area, which is is up a bit from from twenty twenty three. Can you just talk a little bit about what your future development split will look like? Will we see more activity shift to, to central PA versus uh, southwest PA over time? Yeah, I think as we, we've talked about historically, we're, we're very focused on continuing to develop that Southwest PA asset. That's where the bulk of our infrastructure is currently. And right now, you know, we we assess those opportunities on a on a NPV kind of total IRR basis. Um, we did drill some CPA Uticas as well, the wells this year, um, and we've talked about those. Um, we expect those to come online next year, and that's some of the tills you're talking about. Um, but overall, 
you know, in the next few years, the mix should look pretty consistent um, that you've seen historically. But in the longer term, you would see us migrate up towards CPA towards the latter part of the decade. Great. Thanks for the color, guys. The next question comes from Leo Mariani with Roth MKM. Please go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up a little bit uh, on kind of production, uh, you know, trajectory here in, in 2024. I know you guys only had kind of two kills in the fourth quarter. So just generally speaking, should we expect kind of production to dip a little bit here in the, the second quarter and then kind of start kind of moving up as we get to the middle of the year to kind of hit that, that guidance range? And I know that, you know, previously last year you kind of had the point estimate on, on guidance, and, and this year you got a little bit of a range. So maybe just provide any kind of color around that would be helpful. Yeah, you'll see kind of similar to what you saw last year. Q1 will probably be the low number for our volumes, and that'll build throughout the year, and we should end the, the year um, at the highest kind of quarterly run rate. But on average, you know, we, as we talked about, we're trying to maintain kind of a flat production profile on an annual basis of about 580 bees. Got it. Okay, uh, that's helpful. And then can you just talk a little bit more about, um, you know, how you get from 2024 capital to 2025 capital? So you've got – Roughly six hundred million, uh, you know, this year, and it's expected to kind of step down to, to closer to five hundred next year. Can you maybe just kind of talk us through a little bit what the the kind of delta there is? Yeah, what you're seeing there is what we we kind of set out to achieve, right? We're going to hold production flat and focus on capital efficiency. And when you do hold production flat, you end up needing to turn in line fewer and fewer wells each year. So the twenty five plan is going to, you know, you should expect to see fewer tills and. With that comes lower capital, right, particularly on the completion side. So that's really the big driver there. We're not modeling any sort of cost reductions or anything of that. It's truly an activity-based reduction. Got it. So I mean, I'm assuming a lot of this is probably just a, a function of lower decline rates as you continue to, to hold production flatter. It's just taking fewer wells. And is there also any kind of component that you're seeing where, you know, perhaps the, the wells have improved at all? I'm just trying to get a, a sense of, uh, you know, it's a pretty big step down, right? Going from 600 to 500, you know, call it 17, 18 percent less capital. It's a, it's a really nice change in efficiency. We just wanted to see if there's any kind of well improvement uh, performance component here. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't describe it as well improvement performance. I mean, we will have the the CPA Utica wells in that blend next year, and we expect those to be very robust, like we saw in prior prior years. Um, so really, it's just you know the. To maintain 580, you hit it. The production declines are lower. The, the capital intensity on the infrastructure side is lower. Um, and you end up with lower completion activity. So that's right where we want to be. Okay. It's always Thank a you. signal to grow production in this basin. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. Thank you. The next question comes from Michael Sciala with Stevens. Please go ahead. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Maybe just to follow up on, on Leo's question there too. I'm just curious uh, with that step down to uh, 500 million. Was there anything built in uh, capex wise for the Adams Fork project in that time frame, or was that further out? No, that was further out. Okay, got it. Um, and then uh, your production uh, guidance for this year. Looks like you're implying some mid single digit growth year over year. I want to see how you see the in basin fundamentals playing out this year and any concern about potential bottlenecks on storage or export capacity? No, I mean, it's all going to be weather dependent. Um, I think up here, uh, Pierce have been pretty consistent and staying flat. Um, so, you know, we'd expect the, the supply side to remain steady and it's going to be a demand function. Um, you know, we'll see how kind of we get through the winter here the rest of february and march and we'll have a better view on that but you know we're we're protected in any scenario um you know with our hedge book so we're we're ready to go for whatever 24 brings gotcha um and uh if i could ask one more the for this year's uh non-drilling capex uh the 145 to 175 million you talked about can you give uh any rough split on the the land midstream and, and new tech uh uh, break out there. Yeah, the new tech's in a separate bucket. It's in that discretionary line, and that's pretty de minimis. Um, it's in that five to ten million range, but that also includes all of our efforts on ESG reductions. So um, there's two kind of things in that bucket. On the land side, uh, if you're around the thirty million 
sort of range and the rest is split between water infrastructure and midstream infrastructure that kind of keeps up with the field development. Great. Appreciate it. Again, if you have a question, please press star then one. The next question comes from Jacob Roberts with TPH. Please go ahead. Morning. Morning, morning Jacob. We were, morning. We were wondering if you're able to give any insight into the split of the 75 million in new tech uh, in terms of perhaps credits versus private party transactions. And then is there any expectation, you know, given the volatility uh, of those markets in terms of how they'll be monetized on a quarterly basis? So, uh, as we've said in our prepared commentary, the the, uh, uh, the sources for the the, the the cash flow for tech is coming from the APS market. There's some of the compliance markets that, that we're part of, and uh, uh, there's some voluntary transactions that, that that we've taken. So, at this point in time, we're making some dynamic decisions on where the opportunity is and and where to direct those. Those attributes too, so it's difficult to provide the, the, the split on a on an ongoing basis. But but I, what I would say is uh, that uh, uh, some of the other transactions on the on the voluntary side and all that stuff, they're all driven by what the what the other opportunity costs are. So the APS program is probably like a, like a good driver for what the what the realization would be uh, uh, for for some of this stuff. And then uh, the variability is kind of, is going to come from the volume and what's happening in that market for for pricing uh, the APS market. Okay, I appreciate that. And then my my second question, at a high level, how are you guys thinking about uh, balancing uses of FCF in the coming years between shareholder returns, which have been on a solid pace, uh, potential debt reduction, or even maybe how you're planning to handle those maturities in the 26, 27 time frame? Yeah, so, you know, we've been pretty consistent and kind of messaging to the market. In the longer term, you know, we are looking to uh, delever. That's going to occur through kind of absolute debt reduction as well as kind of growth in gas pricing and the new tech revenue side. Um, you know, we're well positioned right now with where the balance sheet sits and where the hedge book sits um, to have the luxury to basically deploy, you know, close to 100% of free cash flow to the shareholder returns. Um, you know, it's a on kind of a quarter by quarter decision, though, you know, to continue that pace, right? We always talk about following the math, and that's what we do. Right now, we still see a lot of opportunity in the undervalued shares to continue where we're at. Great. Appreciate the time. The next question comes from John Abbott with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Hey, Robbie, my question's for you. You talked about those three different opportunities to grow free cash flow on the new technology side. You've talked about these commercial opportunities in bucket number two. Can you provide any more yeah. color on what those are approximately? What are you looking at there? Or do we have to wait and see? Uh, like what I could say is like we, uh, uh, we've developed a, port, you know, a portfolio of IP around uh, opportunities that help reduce costs on the on the uh, on the oil and gas uh, flowback completion side of things, and uh, reduces emissions on that side of things, it's it's very exciting and uh, uh, and more to come on that front. I think uh, uh, it's uh, uh, it's been in the in this prototype phase. We've, we've been doing a lot of testing on that, but I think we're at a point where it starts to take some commercial scale. So uh, stay tuned. In the next couple of quarters, we'll have much better uh, idea of how that shapes out in the in the free te uh, new tech free cash flow uh, in the coming years. I appreciate it. And then my other one's just sort of a quick follow up just in you know you you gave your 7 year plan a while back, you know. Any thoughts about when you may update your longer term guidance? Yeah, I mean right now, you know, we we've, we've been extremely successful in that plan, you know, it's we're at 33% of the share repurchases. We still got three years left to go on that plan. Um, you know, when there's a material change to kind of the strategy that we've laid out, that's be the appropriate time to update it. Right now, there's nothing that I could point to that's, that's planned to do so. All right. Thank you very much. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Tyler Lewis for any closing remarks. 
Great. Thank you again for joining us this morning. Please feel free to reach out if anyone has any additional questions. Otherwise, we will look forward to speaking with everyone again next quarter. Thank you. The conference has now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.